Greetings. My name is Alison Dean. Welcome to my study here in Chelmsford, England. It is my pleasure today to be able to read to you a chapter from The Story Girl. But before I do so, I'd just like to introduce you to some of our reading companions. Up on the top shelf is Manny Bear. He was given to me many years ago by my sister Andrea Mackenzie, and he comes from New York. On the second shelf is Torstein. He comes from St. Margaret's Hope, Orkney Island, Scotland. He's only he's one of only seven in the whole world, which makes him rather rare. James Bear is also a rare bear now. He comes originally from the Greenbow Hotel in Chester, but that hotel is no longer. But he still reminds us often of Chester. It's a beautiful city. And last but not certainly not least, is Cuddle Up Book Bear with his own teddy. And I don't remember how I got him. I believe he was given to me by someone. But because he's a book bear, he's a good bear to have join us today as we read. I'll be reading <clears throat> The Tale of the Rainbow Bridge, Chapter 28, from my 1926 Harrop's edition. Please sit back and enjoy. Felix, so far as my remembrance goes, never attained to success in the ordeal of bitter apples. He gave up trying after a while, and he also gave up praying about it, saying in bitterness of spirit that there was no use in praying when other fellows prayed against you out of spite. He and Peter remained on bad terms for some time, however. We were all of us too tired those nights to do any special praying. Sometimes I fear our regular prayers were slurred over or mumbled in anything but reverent haste. October was a busy month on the hill farms. The apples had to be picked, and this work fell mainly to us children. We stayed home from school to do it. It was pleasant work, and there was a great deal of fun in it, but it was hard, too and our arms and backs ached roundly at night. In the mornings, it was very delightful. In the afternoons, tolerable. But in the evenings, we felt lagged, and the laughter and the zest of fresher hours were lacking. Some of the apples had to be picked very carefully. But with others, it did not matter. We boys would climb the trees and shake the apples down until the girls shrieked for mercy. The days were crisp and mellow, with warm sunshine and a tang of frost in the air, mingled with the woodsy odors of the withering grasses. The hens and turkeys prowled about, picking at wet fall, pecking at windfalls, and Pat made mad rushes at them amid the fallen leaves. The world beyond the orchard was a royal magnificence of colouring under the vivid blue autumn sky. The big willow by the gate was a splendid golden dome, and the maples that were scattered through the spruce grove waved blood-red banners over the sombre cone-bearers. The story girl generally had her head garlanded with their leaves. They became her vastly. Neither Felicity nor Cecily could have worn them. Those two girls were of a domestic type that assorted ill with the wildfire in nature's veins. But when the story girl wreathed her nut-brown tresses with crimson leaves, it seemed, as Peter said, that they grew on her, as if the gold and flame of her spirit had broken out in a coronal, as much a part of her as the pale halo seems a part of the Madonna it encircles. What tales, she told us, on those faraway autumn days, peopling the, peopling the russet arcades with folk of an elder world. Many a princess rode by us on her palfrey. Many a swaggering gallant ruffled it bravely in velvet and plume adown adown Uncle Stephen's walk. Many a stately lady, silken clad, walked in that opulent orchard. <clears throat> when we had filled our baskets, they had to be carried to the granary loft, 
and the contents stored in bins or spread on the floor to ripen further. We ate a good many, of course, feeling that the laborer was worthy of his hire. The apples from our own birthday trees were stored in separate barrels inscribed with our names. We might dispose of them as we willed. Felicity sold hers to Uncle Alec's hired man and was badly cheated to boot, for he levanted shortly afterwards, taking the apples with him, having paid her only half her rightful due. Felicity has never got over that to this day. Cecily, dear heart, sent most of hers to the hospital in town, and no doubt gathered in therefrom dividends of gratitude and satisfaction of soul, such as can never be purchased by a mere process of bargain and sale. The rest of us ate our apples, or carried them to school, where we bartered them for such treasures as our schoolmates possessed, and we coveted. There was a dusky little pear-shaped apple from one of Uncle Stephen's trees, which was our favorite, and next to it, delicious yellow, juicy apple from Aunt Louisa's tree. We were also fond of the big sweet apples. We used to throw them up in the air and let them fall on the ground until they were bruised and battered to the bursting point. Then we sucked the juice. Sweeter was it than the nectar drunk by blissful gods on the Thessalian hill. Sometimes... We worked until the cold yellow sunsets faded out over the darkening distances, and the hunter's moon looked down on us through the sparkling air. The constellations of autumn scintillated above us. Peter and the story girl knew all about them and imparted their knowledge to us generously. I recall Peter standing on the pulpit stone one night ere moonrise, and pointing them out to us. Occasionally having a difference of opinion with the story girl over the name of some particular star. Job's coffin and the Northern Cross were to the west of us. South of us flamed Fummelhook. The great square of Pegasus was over our heads. Cassiopeia sat enthroned in her beautiful chair in the northeast. And north of us, the dippers swung, untiringly around the pole star. Cecily and Felix were the only ones who could distinguish the double star in the handle of the big dipper, and greatly did they plume themselves thereon. The story girl told us the myths and legends woven around these immemorial clusters, her very voice taking on a clear, remote, story sound as she talked of them. When she ceased, we came back down to earth, feeling as if we had been millions of miles away in the blue ether, and that all our old familiar surroundings were momentarily forgotten and strange. Mm -hmm. That night, when he pointed out the stars to us from the pulpit stone, was the last time for several weeks that Peter shared our toil and pastime. The next day, he complained of headache and sore throat, and seemed to prefer lying on Aunt Olivia's kitchen sofa to doing any work. As it was not in Peter to be a malingerer, he was left in peace while we picked the apples. Felix alone, most unjustly and spitefully, declared that Peter was simply shirking. He's just lazy. That's what's the matter with him, he said. Why don't you talk sense, if you must talk, said Felicity. There's no sense in calling Peter lazy. You might as well say I had black hair. Of course, Peter, being a Craig, has his faults. But he's a smart boy. His father was lazy, but his mother hasn't a lazy bone in her body, and Peter takes after her. Uncle Roger says,
Peter's father wasn't exactly lazy, says the story girl, said the story girl. The trouble was, there were so many other things he liked better than work. I wonder if he'll ever come back to this, to his family, said Cecily. Just think how dreadful it would be if our father had left us like that. Our father is a king, said Felicity loftily, and Peter's father is only a Craig. A member of our family couldn't behave like that. They say there must be a black sheep in every family, said the story girl. There isn't any in ours, said Cecily loyally. <clears throat> Why do white sheep eat more than black? asked Felix. Is that a conundrum? asked Cecily cautiously. If it is, I won't try to guess the reason. I never can guess conundrums. It isn't a conundrum, said Felix. It's a fact. They do, and there's a good reason for it. <clears throat> we stopped picking apples, sat down on the grass, and tried to reason it out. With the exception of Dan, who declared he knew there was a catch somewhere, he was not going to be caught. The rest of us could not see where any catch could exist, since Felix solemnly vowed, cross his heart, white sheep did eat more than black. We argued over it seriously, but finally had to give it up. Well, what is the reason? asked Felicity. Because there's more of them, said Felix, grinning. I forget what we did to Felix. A shower came up in the evening, and we had to stop picking. After the shower, there was a magnificent double rainbow. We watched it from the granary window, and the story girl told us an old legend, culled from one of Aunt Olivia's many scrapbooks. Long, long ago, in the Golden Age, when the gods used to visit the earth so often that it was nothing uncommon to see them, Odin made a pilgrimage over the world. Odin was the great god of the Northland, you know. And wherever he went among men, he taught them love and brotherhood and skillful arts, and great cities sprang up where he had trodden, and every land through which he passed was blessed, because one of the gods had come down to men. But many men and women followed Odin himself, giving up all their worldly possessions and ambitions. And to these he promised the gift of eternal life. All these people were good and noble and unselfish and kind. But the best and noblest of them all was a youth named Ving. And this youth was beloved by Odin above all others for his beauty and strength and goodness. Always he walked on Odin's right hand, and always the first light of Odin's smile fell on him. Tall and straight was he as a young pine, and his long hair was the color of ripe wheat in the sun, and his blue eyes were like the Northland heavens on a starry night. In Odin's band was a beautiful maiden named Alin. She was as fair and delicate as a young birch tree in spring among the dark old pines and firs, and Ving loved her with all his heart. His soul thrilled with rapture at the thought that he and she together should drink from the fountain of immortality as Odin had promised, and be one thereafter in eternal youth. At last, they came to the very place where the rainbow touched the earth. And the rainbow was a great bridge built of living colors, so dazzling and wonderful that beyond it, the eye could see nothing. Only far away, a great, blinding, sparkling glory where the fountain of life sprang up 
in a shower of diamond fire. But under the rainbow bridge rolled a terrible flood, deep and wide and violent, full of rocks and rapids and whirlpools. There was a warder of the bridge, a god, dark and stern and sorrowful. And to him Odin gave command that he should open the gate and allow his followers to cross the rainbow bridge that they might drink of the fountain of life beyond. And the warder set open the gate. Pass on and drink of the fountain, he said. To all who taste of it shall Im immortality be given. But only to that one who shall drink of it first shall it be permitted to walk at Odin's right hand forever. Then the company passed through in great haste, all fired with a desire to be the first to drink of the fountain and win so marvelous a boon. Last of all came Ving. He had lingered behind to pluck a thorn from the foot of a beggar child he had met on the highway, and he had not heard the warder's words. But when, eager, joyous, radiant, he set his foot on the rainbow, the stern, sorrowful warder took him by the arm and drew him back. Ving, strong, noble, and valiant, he said, Rainbow Bridge is not for thee. Very dark grew Ving's face. Hot rebellion rose in his heart and rushed over his pale lips. Why dost thou keep back the draught of immortality from me? He demanded passionately. The warder pointed to the dark flood that rolled under the bridge. The path of the rainbow is not for thee, he said, but yonder way is open. Ford that flood, on the further bank, is the fountain of life. Thou mockest me muttered Fing sullenly. No mortal could cross that flood. Oh, master, he prayed, turning beseechingly to Odin, thou didst promise to me eternal life as to the others. Wilt thou not keep that promise? Command the warder to let me pass. He must obey thee. But Odin stood silent with his face turned from his beloved, and Ving's heart was filled with unspeakable bitterness and despair. Thou mayest return to earth if thou fearest to essay the flood, said the warder. Nay, said Ving wildly, earthly life without a lin is more dreadful than the death which awaits me in yon dark river and he plunged fiercely in. He swam, he struggled, he buffeted the turmoil. The waves went over his head again and again. The whirlpools caught him and flung him on the cruel walk, rocks. The wild, cold spray beat on his eyes and blinded him so that he could see nothing. And the roar of the river deafened him so that he could hear nothing but he felt keenly the wounds and bruises of the cruel rocks, and many a time he would have given up the struggle had not the thought of Sweet Alin's loving eyes brought him the strength and desire to struggle as long as it was possible. Long, long, long to him seemed that bitter and perilous passage. But at last, he won through to the further side. Breathless and reeling, his vesture torn, his great wounds bleeding, he found himself on the shore where the fountain of immortality sprang up. He staggered to its brink and drank of its clear stream. Then all pain and weariness fell away from him, and he rose up a god, beautiful with immortality. 
and as he did, there came rushing over the rainbow bridge a great company, the band of his fellow travelers. But all were too late to win the double boon. Ving had won to it through the danger and suffering of the dark river. The rainbow had faded out, and the darkness of the October dusk was falling. I wonder, said Dan meditatively, as we went away from that redolent spot, what it would be like to live forever in this world. I expect we'd get tired of it after a while, said the story girl. But, she added, I think it would be a good while before I would. Here ends chapter 28. I hope you enjoyed it.